It's great to be here with you today. And um, before I talk to you about the historic Christian doctrine of the lesser magistrates, I want to just encourage you all as brothers and sisters, as husbands and wives, as fathers and mothers to strengthen your homes. It's extremely important to do so given the state of our nation at this time. Given the state of our nation at this time, it's doubly important to strengthen your relationship with your spouse and with your children and to govern properly your home in the sight of Christ. Um, even the government is doing everything they can to undermine, attack, and destroy the family in the country. Now, they've made laws and policies to do exactly that. Um, when you look at the decriminalization of adultery, when you look at no-fault divorce laws, when you look at homosexual marriage, those laws and policies and a plethora of others are all designed to demean and belittle the institution of marriage and to demean and belittle family. I'm big on family. This is my wife. We had 11 children together, six daughters, five sons. And this is a picture from two years ago. And we, um, we've had five more grandchildren and another daughter-in-law since then. The oldest three are married, and uh, we just found out last weekend that we're having our 12th grandchild. So we thank God for that. There's a great book to read. I tell everybody about this book, Family and Civilization, written in 1947. You got to read it. Um, it was written by a sociologist. I won't go into what sociologists are all about, but most of them are Christ haters. But Carl Zimmerman, who wrote this in 1947, was simply an honest man. And um, he talks about much of the good that Christianity brought to Western civilization for 2,000 years. And in his book, in 1947, he predicted that America would soon see divorce for any reason or no reason at all, which took place in the late 60s, early 70s, that we would soon see legalized abortion, which took place in the early 70s, and that we would see rampant homosexuality in our nation, which, of course, yeah. He based all that on his teachings, on his studies, I should say, of the Greek and Roman civilizations and the French and Bolshevik revolutions. And he found that the tipping point for when civilizations began their descent, began their decline, was when the people no longer wanted to have children. And by that, he didn't mean zero. He meant one or two, when they only want one or two. And from the time that the Greeks didn't want to have children until they fell to the Romans was 150 years. From the time that the Romans fell to the Germanic hordes, uh, didn't want to have children that they fell to the Germanic hordes, was 400, nearly 400 years. America's been in a steep decline now for 150 years. We're not even replacing ourselves anymore. The only reason the population continues to grow is because of immigration. Okay. Zimmerman said this, he said the reason that that's the tipping point, when people no longer want to have children, that it's the beginning of the end of a nation or a civilization. He said it's because when men want to be husbands and fathers and wives want to be, uh, pardon me, women want to be wives and mothers, it produces within people virtue. But when men don't want to be husbands and fathers and men don't, and women don't want to be wives and mothers, it produces within people vice. So it's extremely important for us to understand um, these things at this time that the government is actually at war with the family. And his book is an awesome read to show how that takes place and how things ebb and flow through time. I encourage you to get it, you can get it on Amazon. Every good status knows in order to strengthen the state, you have to weaken the family. That's a fact. And that's what you're living in the midst of. You have a government that's not going to build your family up. They're going to try to finish it off. I always tell every couple who comes to me who's having marriage problems, once one of you calls the government, it's over with. This government doesn't restore marriages, they finish them off. And it's an awful thing to see. So please, keep your face low to the ground before the Lord. Stay close to him. Be a good husband, a good father. Be a good wife. Be a good mother. Make a difference in the earth. Raise godly progeny so they can carry on the torch. Now, getting to the doctrine of lesser magistrates, this is a picture of Plato. He was um, on the streets of Sicily, and he met the tyrant Deontius, surrounded by his many guards. And he walked up to Deontius, and he said, 
what harm have you done that you should need so many guards? And it reminded me of Washington, D.C. If you go there today, the place is a virtual fortress. I went there 20 years ago. It was pretty open, pretty nice. Um, I went there a couple years ago. It is a virtual fortress. It left me thinking exactly what Plato said to Deontius. What harm have you done that you should need so many guards? Now, this doctrine of the lesser magistrates is extremely important. It's called a doctrine because it was actually formulated by Christian men in 1550 in the Magdeburg Confession, which is now available in English for the first time. So it was written over 460 years ago. We use the term magistrate. It's an old English term. It means anyone with lawful civil authority, whether by election or appointment. We call it the lesser magistrate because they possess lawful authority, but the jurisdiction that they rule over is smaller than other higher ranking civil authorities. For instance, the federal government has jurisdiction over the nation. Um, it's supposed to be very limited. And of course, we know they're, they've long left those limitations, those delegated authorities which were given them. Um, or so the governor is a lesser authority in comparison to a federal authority. Or a county official has less authority than a, government, uh, than a governor in the sense that their jurisdiction is smaller. But they all, all possess authority, and they all have a duty to uphold the law and word of God and what they're doing, and they also have a duty to uphold their state constitution and their U.S. constitution, given that we live in America. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. The doctrine of the lesser magistrates is a tool found in scripture and proven in history to rein in tyrannical acts by higher ranking civil authorities. Right now we live in a nation where the federal government is doing the most insane policies and laws you could imagine. Just yesterday, they said that two men and two women can marry and they imposed that upon every state in the union. And unfortunately, the lesser magistrates of all 50 states rather than stand in defiance of such an absurd interpretation of the Constitution, have all said it's now the law of the land and we must obey that. That's why it's important for the people to understand these things so that you can remove the lie of the lesser magistrate who always wants to hide behind the skirt of the federal government and say, a federal court is ruled, we can do nothing else but obey. The doctrine of the lesser magistrate simply defined is right here. It's when the higher ranking civil authority makes unjust or immoral laws, policies, or court opinions, the lower or lesser ranking civil authority has both the right and the duty not to obey the higher authority, and if necessary, to actively resist the higher authority. That's the doctrine in a nutshell. Um, it was actually a higher magistrate, Roman Emperor Trajan, who kind of succincted the doctrine. One time when giving a sword to a subordinate, he said these words, use this sword against my enemies if I give righteous commands. But if I give unrighteous commands, use it against me. And that is the doctrine in a nutshell. The doctrine is thoroughly founded in scripture. John Knox wrote his appellation to the nobles of Scotland in 1558. He was deeply indebted to the writers of the Magdeburg Confession. He cited over 70 passages of scripture within his appellation. You can find it online, you can read it yourself, you can get it in books and read what he had to say hundreds of years ago. It is, to my thinking, the foremost treatise on the doctrine of the lesser magistrate ever written. Um, this is Caligula. If you know anything about Caligula, yeah, he was kind of tyranny personified. And, um, Caligula in 39 AD got ticked off at the Jews about something and so he decided to have a statue of himself made and placed in the temple in Jerusalem. So he contacted the governor of Palestine whose name was Publius Petronius and he ordered Publius Petronius to have a statue of himself made to gather his men, 12,000 strong, and to have the statue placed within the temple. Publius Petronius being governor listened to the law of the emperor, and he had the statue made, he assembled 12,000 troops, and he was waiting for spring to bring it in. He figured there might be a little trouble with the Jews coming in and putting a statue of the emperor in their temple. 
Well, the Jews got wind of all this, and they actually sent out a delegation to Governor Petronius and pleaded with him, remonstrated, said, don't do this. This is immoral. You know, this is an attack upon our religion. This is wrong. Please do not obey the law of the emperor. Um, Governor Petronius, of course, responded by saying, I want to live. I don't care what you think. I'm beholden to the emperor. And so go away. Well, these Jews weren't like most Americans, where they make one little letter and then never talk to their magistrate again. They actually came back with more of them. This time, 10,000 of them came back, and they pleaded with them again. And then the number grew to 30,000. And they actually laid down on the ground that time and bared their necks to them and said, kill us now, because we cannot live in peaceful coexistence with this attack upon our religion, this immorality being foisted upon us through the law of the emperor. Well, Governor Petronius removed himself to Tiberias, and the Jews still didn't give up. This went on for two months. They followed him over there. They were actually neglecting their fields because this was of huge importance to them. They weren't planting their fields. They were following the governor around, asking for interposition against the law of the emperor. Finally, Governor Petronius called the Jews. About 10,000 came. And when they walked into the arena where um, Governor Petronius had called them, there were 12,000 Roman soldiers there. And the story is this. Governor Petronius announced to them that he would not obey the law of the emperor. He announced to them he would not do it. In fact, when they came in, there were 12,000 Roman soldiers. So you had 12,000 Roman soldiers here, 10,000 Jews here. They were a little trepidatious. The Jews were, because last time they had laid their necks to him and said, kill us now. So they thought, maybe this is it. Petronius, Governor Petronius, read the law of the emperor, which disobedience was death. He then stepped out in between the Jews, in between the soldiers and the Jews, and declared he would not obey the law of the emperor, and that he would send a letter to him asking him to repeal his law, which he did. And when Caligula got the letter, like all good tyrants do, he was mad. So he sent a letter to Petronius to kill himself. Well, two weeks after the ship left, carrying news for Petronius to kill himself, in God's providence, the Praetorian Guard killed Caligula. And fortunately for Governor Petronius, the ship carrying word for him to kill himself arrived after the ship carrying news that the emperor had been assassinated. <laughs> so it's a great little story about the doctrine of the lesser magistrates in action. Now, this doctrine applies to all forms of government, whether it's a monarchy, whether it's a democracy, whether it's a limited constitutional representative republic. This doctrine applies to every form of government. It's important for you to understand that. Interposition is what Governor Petronius demonstrated when he stepped out in between the soldiers and the Jews. We call this the doctrine of of interposition. It is a historic Christian doctrine found in scripture. For example, like the Hebrew midwives, they were told to kill the children. Instead, they interposed, made up a story, and kept the Hebrew children alive, the male Hebrew children. Another story would be Saul's foolish edict, where he said, nobody eats anything until we defeat our enemy. His son Jonathan didn't hear about it. He ate some honey. Saul was going to kill his own son, and it says that the people intervened and said, you will not lay one hand on Jonathan for the great deeds he has done today. They interposed on behalf of Jonathan and protected him from death. When it comes to the interposition of the lesser magistrate, he interposes on behalf of the people against a tyrannical higher civil authority. The uh, doctrine of interposition is that calling of God which causes one to step into the gap, willingly placing himself between the oppressor and his intended victim. Chet did that as a lesser magistrate, as a police officer. All those other people were doing it. They were interposing too. They were committing interposition. They were doing it as citizens. He was doing it as a magistrate. By the way, Chet Gallagher is the only magistrate in all of America to stand on behalf of the preborn in interposition 
and lose his job because of it. There, yes, it's true. In over 40 years of the killing of the preborn, not one governor, not one legislature, not one mayor, not one city council has stood in defiance of murder. And it's an awful thing to watch. And it's because they've believed a lie that we just have to obey the Supreme Court. And that is a fiction, uh, which I'll address here shortly also. There's the verse Chet quoted, Ezekiel 22, 27 through 31. You can read that in your own time. Um, that's the words that Petronius said. I'll skip past that. Now, it's important to understand when it comes to the defiance or the interposition or the revolt of the lesser magistrate against the higher authority, that this isn't lawlessness. Okay, when someone says it's okay to murder, they're the ones who have created chaos. They're the ones who have created anarchy. Those who don't go along with such an evil decree are actually the ones trying to restore order to the land. Do you understand that? Yes. Now, there's many lesser things that need to be remedied or for, we have to forbear, but there's three reasons why the lesser magistrates should openly defy, and I want to give those to you. The first is they are to oppose and resist any laws or edicts from the higher authority, which contravenes, that means opposes or contradicts the law or word of God. That's the first. There's nothing to be discussed at that point. You don't go along with it. Okay. The second is this. They are to protect the person, property, and liberty of those who reside within their ju jurisdiction from any tyrannical attacks by the higher authority. Okay? So the higher authority makes some awful thing that attacks the property or person of someone within the jurisdiction of a lesser magistrate. He has a duty to interpose and protect them. And the third one is, given that we live in America, they are not to implement any laws, policies, or court opinions made by the higher authority that violate or exceed the U.S. Constitution or their state constitution, and if necessary, resist them. This is an important point. This whole idea, and I'm going to address this further, that we should just, oh, it's the law of the land now, homosexual marriage, because the Supreme Court ruled, is a fiction. And now, more than ever, the lesser magistrates have their duty to uphold the Constitution Amen. and not go along with that perverted opinion issued by nine men. The law of God is the objective standard whereby we measure the laws of men. I'm telling you, this is like the most massive, important point to understand. This was the case in Western civilization for 1,500 years. Whether you read Alfred the Great in the 9th century, whether you read John of Salisbury in the 12th century, whether you read William Blackstone, the most cited legal scholar by America's founders in the 18th century, they all pointed to God's law as being that law to which all men and all governments of men were accountable. They referred to God's moral law as higher law. All were accountable to it. If you made law contrary to it, it was viewed as no law at all. Understand? Let me give you an example about this. William Blackstone, um, most cited legal scholar by America's founders, said this about God's law. He said, upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of revelation, God's written law, depend all human laws. That is to say, no human laws should be suffered to contradict these. Okay, he was the number one jurist our founders appealed to in the foundation of American jurisprudence. He said any laws which contradict God's law shouldn't be suffered amongst us. Yet here we have a whole nation of people going along with the slaughter of helpless preborn babies and now the federal imposition of homosexual marriage, trampling 31 state constitutions. That he was talking about God's laws found in Holy Scripture is seen in what he went on to say. It, talking about God's law, is binding over all the globe. You got that? Over all the globe, in all countries, and at all times. No human laws are of any validity 
if contrary to this, and such of them as are valid derive all their force and all their authority immediately or immediately from this original, the doctrines thus delivered we call the revealed or divine law, and they are found only in the Holy Scriptures. Okay? He was talking about God's word. God's law is revealed in Scripture. And this was the thinking of men. Divine law trumps human law. Extremely important to understand. Um, James Madison, who was one of the first Supreme Court justices appointed by George Washington himself, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, said this regarding God's law. He said, as promulgated by reason and the moral sense, it has been called natural. As promulgated by the Holy Scriptures, it has been called revealed law. As addressed to men, it has been denominated the law of nature. As addressed to political societies, it has been denominated the law of nations. But it should always be remembered that this law, whether natural or revealed, made for men or for nations, flows from the same divine source. It is the law of God. Amen? He went on to say, human law must rest its authority ultimately upon the authority of that law which is divine. Okay? This was the thinking of Western men for 1,500 years. It's been over the last 100 or so years where the law of God has been thrown under the bus. Even most... Most of Christianity has thrown the law of God under the bus. If the Christians are going to be hostile to the law of God, what do you think the pagans are going to do? When you take the objective standard, remember the law of God is the objective standard by which we judge the laws of men. Once you remove the objective standard, what does that create for the state? It creates the opportunity to redefine law, to redefine what's good and what's evil, to make it up as they go to make it up out of thin air. Um, Francis Schaeffer said this. He said, if there are no absolutes by which to judge society, then society becomes an absolute. That's where we're at now. We've removed the objective standard by which we judge the laws of men, whether they're just or unjust, whether they're moral or immoral. And what we're left with is society now determining what is right. It's crazy. I want to talk about government quickly. God has established four realms to which he delegates authority. There's self-government, family government, church government, civil government. Each has its own role in jurisdiction. One invades the jurisdiction, the other chaos ensues. Right now we have a federal government, pardon me, we have government, period, that has invaded self-government and family government. And many churches have allowed themselves to be invaded by government by voluntarily becoming 501c3s. The authority an individual possesses in any one of these four governments is delegated authority. You see that there? Very important. In other words, they derive their authority from God. Their authority is not autonomous or unconditional. Their authority is God-given, and thus they have a duty to govern in accordance with his rule. Extremely important to understand. Talk about that at length in my book also. John of Salisbury, how many of you read Polycraticus? Every one of my sons and daughters has to read Polycraticus. It's phenomenal. Here's what John of Salisbury said regarding authority. He said, all power, or authority, is from the Lord God. The power which the prince has is therefore from God. For the power of God is never lost nor severed from him, but he merely exercises it through a subordinate hand. Okay? Salisbury said, what makes one a tyrant is when they actually make law contrary to the law of God. That's when they have become a tyrant and they are no longer a prince. He said this regarding the lesser authorities, regarding the lesser magistrates. He said, loyal shoulders should sustain the power of the ruler so long as his exercise is protection to God and follows his ordinances. But if it resists and opposes the divine commandments and wishes to make me share in its war against God, then with unrestrained voice, I answer that God must be preferred before any man on earth. Okay? This was the thinking of Western men down through the ages. Important to understand. Now I want to talk to you about the role of the people. This is Governor Petronius' statement when he was first um, asked by the Jews to defy the emperor's law. And as you can see, he just wanted to live. They persisted, they didn't go away. 
And here's part of what he said when um, he stood between the soldiers and them. He said, and may God be your assistant for his authority is beyond all the contrivance and power of men. You got that? His authority is beyond all the contrivance and power of men. And may he procure you the preservation of your ancient laws. And may not he be deprived, though without your consent, of his accustomed honors. But if Caligula be irritated and turn the violence of his rage upon me, I will rather undergo all the danger and affliction that may come either on my body or my soul than see so many of you perish while you are acting in so excellent a manner. Therefore, every one of you, go your way about your own occupations and follow the cultivation of your ground. I will myself send to Rome and will not refuse to serve you in all things, both by myself and by my friends. What Governor Petronius understood is when you, as Suetonius said, when the lower magistrate defies, he takes the wolf by the ears. It's a great act of bravery when they do so. But you have to understand the role of the people is massive. Governor Petronius would have never did what he did had it not been for the Jews gathering by the thousands and demanding that he take a stand. Often the lesser magistrates have to be prodded to do right. That's our duty. We must prod them to do right. And then we must assure them of our full support both of our very person, of our finances, of our very lives, if necessary, to stand with them when the tyrant comes out of his lair to attack them. Do you understand how important your role is in the doctrine of the lesser magistrate? It's massive. Now, this is all good for us. This is good for us because this forces us to build relationship with our magistrates, with our local authorities, our state authorities, our county, our municipal authorities. That's good. That's a, that's a good thing. We need to do that. Look, have you ever read about peasant wars? They never go good for the peasants, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm a, I'm a read, voracious reader of history. It's like one in a million where the peasant war goes good for the peasants. You know, if you just want to show up on the corner with a bunch of friends and shotguns, let me tell you, the federal government will lay that down in about two seconds. See, the higher tyrannical authority always banks and counts on the compliance of their lesser authorities. And when they don't have that, that's when they have a problem on their hands. That's when trouble's brewing, and they know it. Now, our federal masters have been incredibly smart at how they've built this system from what it was to what it's become because they've tied all the lesser authorities to the federal purse. And so now... The lesser magistrates are more beholden to their federal masters than they are to do right in the sight of God or to do right for the benefit of the citizens they represent. So we're up against some huge stuff here. But your role as the people is huge in this process. And you must demand of them to do right. Not could you, would you, should you? No, you must. It is needed and necessary. Lay it out to them. Demand that they do right. Accept nothing less than what is needed and necessary. Don't allow them. You know, the Bible says put a knife to your throat when you meet with the ruler. You know why it says that? Because we need to put a knife to our throat when we meet with the ruler. Because he's going to say all these little dancey things to try to make you feel bad for him. Never feel bad for a politician. They knew what they were getting into when they got involved. Demand that they do what's right, needed, and necessary, and accept nothing less. Yeah. If you keep, it's true. I've watched this with pro-life for decades. They keep giving them little things to nibble at the edges of abortion, rather than just saying, defy. Interpose for the pre-born, uphold our state statute, which criminalizes abortion. Who cares what the feds have said and their little federal court opinion? But the pro-lifers keep giving them less things to do. And the politicians love that. One thing about politicians is, if you give them anything less than what's needed and necessary, they'll take it. Every single time they'll take it. And let me tell you, I've talked with many in state houses across America who have told me that Christians are the biggest laughing stock in our state house. Christians are the biggest laughing stock in state houses across America. You know why? Because the politicians know the Christians will roll the quickest.
to get the smallest little crumb. They're happy. They go away. They get patted on the head. And what are we talking about? Things of huge importance, like murder of innocent people, like God's law, word, and created order being impugned by a federal government trampling state constitutions regarding marriage. We shouldn't be happy with the crumb we must demand. Here's what Frederick Douglass, who was an abolitionist, said. He said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed on them. And these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. And right now, the federal government knows it has a whole country full of people willing to be oppressed. You know, a Supreme Court has ruled we must obey. It is a fiction. You go to our website, lessermagistrate.com. We now have a second website called defytyrants.com. Defytyrants.com takes you to lessermagistrate.com. I just got the second one because everybody kept telling me on radio shows, what, how do you spell that? I can't remember that name. But everybody remembers Defy Tyrants. <laughs> so <laughs> defytyrants.com, we have much written by good scholarly men regarding these issues I'm talking to you about. Here is what some of our founding fathers said. This was said by James Madison in the Virginia Resolution. This is just 11 years after the Constitution the ink dried in the Constitution, there was already a conflict between states and our federal government. Did our officials then, our founding fathers, expect the states just to go along with immoral or unjust laws, policies, or court opinions? Absolutely not. Here's what James Madison said in the Virginia Resolution in defiance of federal tyrannical action. Remember who James Madison is? He's known as the architect or the father of the U.S. Constitution. Yes. Here's what he said. The states who are parties thereto, parties to the U.S. Constitution, have the right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of evil and for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities, rights, and liberties appertaining to them. They expected the states to defy when the government made egregious, unjust, or immoral actions, laws, policies, or court opinions. Thomas Jefferson said this in the Kentucky Resolution. Both of these states defied the federal government. He said, in that whensoever the general government, talking about the federal government, assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. Very important stuff. They expected defiance. Notice that word delegated. The authority of the federal government is delegated what they can do in the Constitution. They've long left the restraints that that document was intended to bind them to. And now the states have been reduced to mere implementation centers for immoral, unjust federal policies, laws, and court opinions, when in actuality they should defy. They should interpose. Um, Here's what Madison also said in Federalist Number 45. He said, the powers de delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. You got to remember, Madison was a Federalist. There were men like Patrick Henry, who was an anti-Federalist, and they were having big debates, which were being published in the New York Times. He wanted to assure everybody that just because we have this general government, doesn't mean the, the government will be able to run roughshod over the states. Here's what he went on to say in Federalist number 46. He said, should an unwarrantable measure of the federal government be unpopular in particular states, the means of opposition to it are powerful and at hand. The disquietude of the people, the repugnance and perhaps refusal to cooperate with the officers of the union, the frowns if the executive magistracy of the state the embarrassments created by legislative devices, which would often be added on such occasions, would oppose in any state difficulties not to be despised, would form in a large state very serious impediments, and where the sentiments of several adjoining states happen to be in unison, would present obstructions which the federal government would hardly be willing to encounter. They expected the states to stand in defiance 
of stuff that clearly contravenes the law and word of God, where the federal government assumes powers outside those delegated to them by the U.S. Constitution. Here's a story where I'm from. Um, this is a runaway slave, Joshua Glover. We just did a tour last week on behalf of the preborn, drawing application to this story to the preborn. He was arrested by federal marshals and broken out of jail by a crowd of 5,000 people, made it to Canada and died 20 years later. They charged this man, Sherman Booth, under the Federal Fugitive Slave Act um, as the ringleader. And our state legislature and our state Supreme Court in Wisconsin, where I'm from, defied the federal government and they defied the U.S. Supreme Court and declared the Federal Fugitive Slave Act to be without authority, void, and of no force. And they actually kept Sherman Booth from being arrested for over four years while federal marshals tried to capture him. This is still eulogized and memorialized there in Milwaukee where I'm from. This is a highway overpass on the one side and a plaque in the other place where the jail was where he was broken out. Here's what they said, resolved that this assumption of jurisdiction by the federal judiciary in the said case and without process and act of undelegated power and therefore without authority, void and of no force. Here's what Thomas Jefferson said in the Kentucky Resolutions. If those who administer the general government, the federal government, be permitted to transgress the limits fixed by the compact, talking about the U.S. Constitution, by a total disregard to the special delegation of power therein contained, annihilation of the state governments and the erection upon their ruins of a general consolidation government will be the inevitable consequence. We've been there for decades already. Our founding fathers never intended this. Everybody would be sitting around hand-wringing, listening to our state authorities say, well, the federal courts have ruled it's the law of the land. The federal judiciary does not get to write law. Do you understand that? They give opinions. That's all they do. There was no law made yesterday. There was only an opinion given by the court. You know the federal courts cannot come in and make the states implement homosexual marriage? You know that your state legislators will have to gather and change those laws themselves. You do understand that. While 70% of Nebraskans approved our amendment to our state constitution, this is Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts yesterday after the Supreme Court ruling about homosexual marriage. He's a Republican. While 70% of Nebraskans approved our amendment to our state constitution that defined marriage is only between a man and a woman, the highest court in the land has ruled states cannot place limits on marriage between same-sex couples. We will follow the law and respect the ruling outlined by the court. So what you hear from them all the time is that we must respect the rule of law. Well, the rule of law was God's moral law for over 1,500 years. It's now been thrown under the bus. If the rule of law says two men can marry or murder is okay, and we say we should obey the rule of law, we should honor it, we've turned the rule of law on its head. We're not defending the rule of law. We're defending tyrants. We've actually joined in their rebellion against God. Now, you know, Alabama defied the federal government and showed all the other states. All the other states had federal judges that were telling them that, um, uh, yeah, you have to impose homosexual marriage. And all the other governors, including ours, Governor Scott Walker, I can't say enough negative about said, oh, a court has ruled, this is now the law of the land. Homosexual marriage will now be the law of the land in Wisconsin, I will uphold it. Meanwhile, people like me and others are saying, that's crazy, that's a fiction. Alabama Supreme Court showed what a fiction it was because after a federal judge trampled their state constitution, they interposed and they put out a writ of mandamus ordering all the judges who issued marriage licenses, you will not do it. And they stopped homosexual marriage cold in its tracks by their act of interposition. <laughs> Unfortunately, their governor, Robert Bentley, this is what he had to say yesterday. I have to uphold not only the Constitution of Alabama, but I swore to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And we will uphold the law of the United States. I will uphold the law of the nation. And this is now the law. It is a lie. 
It is not a law. It's an opinion by a court. And is he upholding the Constitution, as he said? He's not. They've made a perverted interpretation of the Constitution. Now more than ever, he is duty-bound to uphold the Constitution and defy them and say, that doesn't teach that. This is called true federalism. In true federalism, everybody understands that all who are in civil authority possess lawful power, lawful authority. And when any part of government makes immoral or unjust laws, policies, or opinions, every other area of government knows they're duty bound not to go along with them, and rather to stand in opposition to them. We've long lost that proper thinking that our founders had, long time ago. We have to get it back to people. And let me tell you, people have ears to hear. You know why? They see a federal government that's renegade, that is lawless and is imposing insanity upon the nation. My book is a self-published book. I'm selling hundreds of copies every month. I do radio interviews every single week. I'm a father with 11 kids, 12 grandkids. I pastor a church, head up a mission for the pre-born. I got no time for self-promotion. This thing has taken off into a life of its own. Why? Because people see the goodness of this doctrine. They see that this is a tool that could rein in a tyrannical higher authority. And in fact, it's been proven down through history to do so bloodlessly. On the cover of my book, I have a picture of the nobles at Runnymede meeting with that tyrant, King John. And it was only because of their combined swords and willingness to use them that John signed that document we call the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, which of course is viewed as the premier document of freedom for all of Western civilization. It was produced by Christian men. You ought to see how much is talked about regarding church and Christ in that document. Christianity has always bred liberty. That's an important thing to understand. They were the lesser magistrates of their day, those nobles who gathered there in the field of Runnymede. And they got the tyrant to conform. That's the same thing that needs to happen today. And the states need to exercise their authority to do so. What happens when a tyrant commits an act of tyranny and everybody goes along with it? He's not noticed to be the tyrant that he is. It's only when people bravely stand in defiance of his tyranny and do what's right that he's forced out of his lair. He has to attack them. And then people begin to see what a tyrant he is. Do you understand how important this is for men to stand? And for us to rally the lesser magistrates to stand. Um, here's what I put on my Facebook wall today. Is this crazy or what? What, what kind of speaker puts up what he you know, put on his Facebook wall this morning? But here's what I wrote. So I've gotten about 20 emails from pro-family and Christian groups all declaring homosexual marriage to now be the law of the land, and each one of them asks for money so they can fight against it. Wow. Roe v. Wade all over again. Calls for a federal constitutional amendment again. This is all a fiction. The reality is when one branch of government violates the Constitution, including the Supreme Court, all other areas of government, federal, state, county, and local, have the duty more than ever to uphold the Constitution and defy that branch of government. This is true federalism. That's a... you know, I, I get calls all the time from state officials. It's encouraging. And they ask me, you know, well, how do we do this? How do we do that? I'm like, well, when it comes to the preborn, just uphold your anti-abortion statute. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to write some new thing. You don't need a constitutional amendment to your state constitution. You don't, you're never going to get a constitutional amendment to the federal constitution. You're living in a fantasy land. Just do your duty. Uphold state law. Defend the preborn. Pretty simple stuff. All right, that important verse out of Proverbs. This is Nick Finch. I'm almost done. Let me finish up here real quick. How many of you know of Sheriff Nick Finch? Two people. He lives in Liberty, Counts, Liberty County, Florida. He's a sheriff there. In March of 2013, a guy was put in his jail. We done? I got to finish? Oh, no, we're okay? Okay. Because I didn't even look at what time it was when I started. Um, so anyways, um, he finds out the guy's in there on, a, on an unconstitutional law which violates the Second Amendment, he lets him out of jail. The Attorney General of the state 
the district attorney of the state, come and arrest him three months later. Charge him with malfeasance in office. The guy's looking at years in prison. You know what the people did? They rallied to their lesser magistrate. They held public demonstrations and said, why are you attacking our sheriff? He's defending our liberty. And they didn't just have one demonstration. They had multiple demonstrations. They put together signature gatherings. In October of 2013, he had his trial. And it only took the jury one hour to find him not guilty of everything. That's the doctrine of the lesser magistrate in action. It's important stuff. Um, this is a lady, I won't go into that story. Here's Judge Roy Moore with the Alabama Supreme Court. You know what he's done there, amen? We'll see what comes forth from there now. This is a great banner uh, Russell made for us for our truth truck, rallying the lesser magistrates on behalf of the preborn. Great stuff. Is that Chris Allen you show? Um, no, it was actually, uh, you're talking about this lady? Yeah. I forget her name, but she's from Maryland. She's a county commissioner. She was ordered by a federal judge not to pray. She prayed anyways. In fact, she prayed a prayer that George Washington prayed on the floor of Congress where he invoked the name of Christ and talked about the Holy Spirit. And the wicked didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> you know, I guess it's like... <laughs> She's a pretty smart cookie. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. So... This is our website, lessermagistrate.com, defytyrants.com. The Magdeburg's available. Let me show you, you know, Scott showed you the two books that are available. And if you get them, you can pick up, I have two sermons and a DVD with 18 short, two to three minute videos explaining the doctrine of Lesser Magistrate, because you know how people don't like to read. And um, so you can give that to those kind of people. So you buy a book, you get those with it, or if you just want one, just go ahead and get one because we want to get them out to as many people as possible. This is our literature sitting on the table. All our literature is free. This is what we put out last week when we did our tour where we were playing off Joshua Glover. I do want to encourage you to get this article, which state will defy the US Supreme Court when it legalizes homosexual marriage. And this is one that I just wrote for a scholarly group that asked me to write an article on it and it's gotten a lot of play, including at Western Journalism, huge website, a lot of thinkers there. It's called The Duty of Lower Magistrates to Face Down the Tyranny of Same-Sex Marriage. I do want to encourage you to pick those up. They're all free. And you can educate yourself more at our website, uh, lessermagistrate.com. There were so many more things I wanted to say, but I'm sure I already went past my time. And I want to thank you for this opportunity. This is of huge importance. God bless you.